In the last 100 years, the country that has had the greatest impact on Spain, or has brought the greatest direct disaster or indirect suffering, is probably the Soviet Union and Russia. The Soviet regime consolidated power through a bloody civil war in the early 1920s. Its goal was to spread communist revolution worldwide. Lenin said the whole world was now capitalist and ripe for revolt. This provoked concern abroad. But revolution was easier proclaimed than done. As early as 1920, Lenin called for peaceful coexistence in foreign relations even while pursuing subversion. So Soviet policy had two faces, official diplomacy seeking peace contrasted with clandestine efforts to stir revolt. Soviet foreign policy in the early decades had for phases. First, initial revolutionary struggle from 1917 to 1923. Second, peaceful coexistence with diminished Comintern agitation in the mid-1920s. Third, a new militancy in 1928 with more Comintern subversion. Finally, seeking anti-fascist alliances in the mid-1930s while still subtly backing revolution. Initially, the Soviets were allies of Imperial Germany in World War I. Germany hoped Lenin would undermine Russia, its enemy. The Germans sent Lenin money and let him travel through their territory to get back to Russia and start his revolt. By 1918, Lenin had created the Red Army and called for an army of three million to spread international workers' revolution. But he needed all his troops to win the Russian Civil War. Once that was done, he offered the Allies peace and trade deals. In March 1919, the Soviets founded the Communist International, the Comintern, to coordinate communist parties abroad. The Comintern parties were to obey Moscow discipline, conduct purges of moderates, and prepare for illegal action. Revolution briefly succeeded in Hungary and Munich, but was soon defeated. A 1920 Soviet offensive into Poland also failed. But Lenin remained optimistic, hoping to spark revolt across Eastern Europe. The 1920 Comintern Congress forced members to accept 21 conditions of orthodoxy. All decisions by Moscow were binding, and the Comintern created a global communist labor network. There were uprisings in Germany and Bulgaria into 1923, but they were defeated. After these failures, the Soviets focused more on diplomacy and the economy. But the Comintern still backed militancy. This strategy backfired, splitting unions and achieving little. After Lenin died in 1924, the Soviets continued seeking worldwide revolution. The Comintern increased central control over its parties. Absolute loyalty to Moscow was now mandatory. Early Soviet foreign policy combined messianic communism with traditional Russian imperialism. For 70 years, supporting revolution abroad while pursuing normal diplomacy at home remained their paradigm. This revolutionary imperialism was tempered more by circumstance than by principle. Back in 1917, when Spain was not a major priority for the newly formed Communist International, or Comintern, which was focused on spreading revolution in Germany and beyond. However, Comintern agents were sent to Spain in late 1919 to help form a Communist Party there. At the time, Spain was culturally part of Western Europe, but economically backward. It had a long history of parliamentary democracy, but this was often frustrated and had recently broken down under a military dictatorship. Socialist and anarchist ideas also had deep roots, though socialism was weak and anarcho-syndicalism dominated the labor movement. When news spread of the 1917 Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, it electrified the Spanish left, especially anarchists who assumed the Bolsheviks were destroying the Russian state. This myth of the revolution inspired some farm worker unrest and strikes from 1918 to 1920 which alarmed elites. The socialists, however, were more cautious, focused on the outcome of World War I. In 1919 the Comintern made its first appeal to the Spanish left to join. The Socialist Party agreed to work with the Comintern while retaining autonomy. A small group split off to form the first Communist Party of Spain in early 1920. However, over the next year both the Socialists and Anarchist National Confederation of Labour rejected the Comintern's conditions. The Communists remained fragmented and tiny through the early 1920s. Meanwhile, the Anarchist Labour movement was carrying out the main revolutionary activity through strikes, and sometimes violent confrontation with employers and the state. 
So while the myth of the Russian Revolution inspired some unrest, communism did not initially take firm root in Spain. The labor movement remained divided and only a marginal force. The main priority was opposing the military dictatorship, not fomenting a communist revolution. The early 1930s. Joseph Stalin had recently risen to power and he was pushing the Soviet Union in a more radical direction. It started in 1928, when Stalin announced a new phase called the Third Period. He said capitalism was facing an inevitable crisis that would spark revolutionary uprisings around the world. The Soviet communists would help lead these revolutions. Now, the communists had different strategies for different types of countries. In advanced capitalist countries like the US, they would try to launch socialist revolutions directly. But in less developed, colonial countries, they would first support bourgeois democratic revolutions against imperialism and feudal landlords. These revolutions would then transition into socialist ones. There was some confusion over countries that were semi-developed, like Spain and Poland. But the main enemy was social democracy in advanced capitalist states. The communists called social democrats social fascists, they said social democracy paved the way for real fascism. This was a ridiculous concept, but it became official policy. At home, Stalin was pushing rapid industrialization and forced collectivization. He feared the Soviet Union would be crushed if it didn't modernize. He built up the military to prepare for an inevitable war between capitalist powers. Now I should note, the communists publicly called for peace and disarmament during this time. But their real view was that violence and civil wars were inevitable for progress. As Stalin wrote privately, we offer a liberating, revolutionary war despite the horrors of bloodshed. In Asia, the Red Army clashed with Chinese forces in Manchuria in 1929. They wanted to control the railways there. This led Japan to later invade Manchuria to oust Soviet influence. The Soviets had to pull back. An attempted Soviet invasion of Afghanistan also failed. In Germany, the communists focused their attacks on the social democrats who supported democracy. The German communist street fighters dressed like fascist militias with uniforms and salutes. They denied this even as they called for a civil war. By 1931, Stalin felt secure enough abroad to push reconciliation. He signed non-aggression pacts with all the countries on his western border. But soon Muslim rebels rose up in the Caucasus. And when Japan took Manchuria, Stalin backed down and offered them an olive branch. He hoped to turn Japan against the US. This began a pattern of trying to spark conflict between other powers that we would see throughout the 1930s. In just a few years, the third period strategy failed entirely. The economic crisis did not spur revolution. But it did help fascists come to power. By 1935, the communists abandoned it for a popular front approach. But the militancy of this era left a legacy. The seeds were planted for both the political violence in Germany and the future Soviet vision of world revolution through war. Though for now, Stalin pulled back and turned to diplomacy abroad while tightening his grip at home. In 1931, a group called the Bloco Brero y Campesino, or BOC, was formed to try to unite workers and peasants into a powerful political force. They wanted to complete Spain's bourgeois revolution, break the power of the church and army, and distribute land to peasants. But they would press this revolution to its highest point to benefit workers. The BOC only got 20,000 votes in the 1931 elections, but soon called for worker organizations to take power. They criticized the new Spanish Republic for not bringing enough change. The BOC put hopes in the anarchist CNT Union to lead a revolution. By 1933 the BOC had softened its tongue a bit. It now focused on freeing the Catalans and Basques from Spanish rule. This brought conflict with the anarchist FAI, who opposed Catalan independence. Violent clashes broke out between them. Meanwhile, the small communist left group of Andrew Min sought a broader front. But the BOC found them too narrow and Trotskyist. The communist left became a Trotskyist ICE party in 1932, separate from the Communist International. In 1933, as fascists took power in Germany, the BOC insisted Spain was different. There was no strong fascist party and workers had not been defeated. 
But when a fascist publication appeared in Madrid, the BOC helped form an anti-fascist Alianza Obrera in Barcelona. This first worker alliance was small but a start. In the 1933 elections the BOC did no better but urged a broad worker front against rising right-wing forces. On December 9, 1933, they formed a bigger Alianza Obrera. It included socialists, the Trentista CNT Union, Trotskyists and others a real united worker front. The goal was to defeat fascism and make a socialist revolution. The collapse of the Spanish Republic between 1936 and the start of the Civil War is a unique case in history. Unlike other European countries during that volatile time, Spain was not reeling from war, foreign threats, or a powerful fascist movement. Instead, this democratic regime simply imploded from within over the course of just a few months. This breakdown really began years earlier, when a radical revolutionary movement emerged alongside the new republic. By 1936, Spain was deeply polarized between moderate republicans on the left and an authoritarian rightist bloc. Elections that year were seen as a referendum on the failed 1934 uprising. When a narrow popular front victory was declared, the inexperienced Prime Minister Azana proved unable to contain the ensuing chaos. The real culprits were the extremes on both left and right who rejected compromise. The militant Kabbalists, the socialists and communists pressured Azana to implement their revolutionary program. Their newspapers brazenly called for completing the democratic revolution by force. Meanwhile, right-wing groups like the CEDA also hoped to impose authoritarian rule if they ever took power. Over the next months, public order collapsed amid escalating violence. Police assaults and illegal arrests of opposition figures became routine, culminating in the assassination of leading conservative spokesman Calvo Sotelo. The murder of this member of parliament by government security forces was Spain's equivalent of a 1922 fascist murder of Italian socialist Matteotti. It confirmed the republic's descent into lawlessness. A key factor was the refusal of Azana's middle-class left Republican Party to build coalitions beyond the worker left. They preferred the suicidal path of appeasing the militant Kabbalaristas. Despite warnings, they were assuming a Kikarinsky role that would lead to their downfall. Tragically, the left Republicans' rigid ideology blinded them to this reality. In their single-minded quest to create a secular, progressive utopia purged of conservative influence, they enabled a revolutionary process that ultimately consumed them. The Kabbalaristas, for their part, cynically used their Republican allies to smooth their own path towards seizing full power. Hence the apt comparison to Russia's moderate socialists who were rapidly pushed aside by the Bolsheviks after the 1917 revolution. Of course we know a military uprising was soon launched against this collapsing republic by rebel nationalist generals. But it was the extremism violence and lawlessness that preceded the outbreak of civil war that ensured the final destruction of Spain's bold democratic experiment. The real villains were not so much the coup plotters, but the political fanatics on both sides who had already murdered democracy in all but name. The military rebellion that triggered the Spanish civil war was a preemptive strike led by middle and junior ranking army officers, who sought a more conservative authoritarian republic to counter the growing anarchy and threat from the expanding revolutionary left. The rebel leaders released forced documents claiming the Comintern planned to take over the government by August, but the evidence shows the Comintern intended to continue the popular front indefinitely. Still, communism had become a catch-all term for the entire revolutionary left from the right's perspective. Calls for patience and discipline from moderates like Prieto and Azana failed to restrain the fundamental attitude of violence on the worker left. Azana only tried forming a compromised government after the revolt began, but it was too late. Power soon passed to the armed revolutionary militias who required the dissolution of the regular army. A dual authority developed between the feeble Republican government in Madrid and the revolutionary groups. In Barcelona, there was dualism between the Catalan government and the worker organizations like the CNT and FAI who formed a central committee of militias holding de facto power. Revolutionary workers' committees took control in much of Republican Spain, with the exception of the Basque country where nationalists governed with the workers' groups. The Spanish Revolution was the last in the post-WWI revolutionary wave touching Russia, Germany and beyond. Expectations, democracy and organization had developed faster than Spain's economy, producing a unique crisis. 
The leftists were confident they could rapidly crush the right, but the Spanish middle classes were a larger minority than in Russia in 1917. Under Franco's stern leadership, conservative sectors demonstrated greater unity and efficiency than the fractious left. Given this and disproportionate foreign intervention, the revolution's fate was sealed. All revolutionary groups expanded, especially the CNT and UGT which each claimed two million members by 1936. The CNT grew faster initially as its decentralized structure was more attractive. In Catalonia the anarchists quickly armed 40,000 militiamen, enjoying more power than the small pro-Soviet parties which merged into the PSUC. The political and military revolution was accompanied by a social and economic one of worker control and collectivization, more thoroughgoing than elsewhere in Europe. Yet most revolutionaries agreed it was useful to maintain a republican government facade for foreign relations. There were great ambitions but ultimate failure amid poor coordination. The revolution brought initial euphoria but increasing hardship and deprivation as the war progressed. While it was popular at first, failures and communist moves for greater central control gradually eroded support over the following year. Initially, the USSR was cautious and uncertain how to respond. The war broke out unexpectedly and complicated Soviet foreign policy goals. However, over August and September, Stalin and Soviet leaders made calculations and plans that led them to decisively intervene with military support for the Spanish Republic. The USSR was the only major power already active in Spain before the war, through the Communist Party. In contrast, Nazi Germany and Fascist Italy were caught off guard when fighting erupted. The Soviet press first accused the fascists of instigating the conflict. But editorials were guarded as Stalin carefully weighed whether the Republic could actually defeat the rebels and whether Soviet aid was needed, or wise. The new Republican government in Madrid appealed to the USSR for weapons since France and Britain refused to send arms. The Soviet leadership evaluated the real situation in Spain and the risks and benefits of involvement. By September, the Politburo approved a detailed military intervention plan. The Soviets sought to portray their motives as defense of Spain's people and fighting fascism. But beyond ideological reasons, Stalin still saw revolutionary potential in Spain useful for Soviet policy. The intervention was complex with many conflicting goals, from collective security to spreading revolution. Debates continue among historians about Stalin's motivations. But the evidence indicates that despite risks, the USSR decisively committed to oppose fascism in Spain. The Spanish Civil War saw extensive Soviet military participation, with over 3,000 personnel involved. This included nearly 800 aircrew flying for the Republicans, several hundred tank crewmen, many officers, and technical support staff. By 1936 the USSR was well positioned to intervene, after years of military build-up. The Republicans received large shipments of arms in late 1936, giving them temporary superiority on the Central Front. The arms were organized by a secret NKVD operation called X-Section. The peak periods for Soviet weapons shipments were October-November 1936, and a six-week period in spring 1937. After that, they became more intermittent but continued to nearly the end of the war. Exact figures are disputed, but the Soviets provided 600 to 800 aircraft, 300 to 400 tanks and armored vehicles, 1,000 to 1,900 artillery pieces, 15,000 to 20,000 machine guns, 400,000 to 500,000 rifles, along with ammunition and other equipment. The Soviet fighter planes, bombers, Tanks and anti-tank guns were generally high quality and state-of-the-art for their time. The tanks were superior to Italian and German models in Spain. But other equipment like rifles and artillery were sometimes outdated surplus. Still, adding planes built in Spain with Soviet assistance, the total Soviet model aircraft may have reached 1,000. The arms gave the Republicans superiority for a time in late 1936. But German and Italian equipment improved eroding this edge during 1937. The Soviets charged very high prices, 30 to 40 percent above market rates. By manipulating exchange rates they inflated costs. Services, training and salaries were expensively billed. By mid-1938 the Spanish gold was gone and further aid meant deeper debt. 
the skill level of Soviet personnel stood out. There were no ordinary infantry, only specialized troops like pilots, tankers and technical staff. Their loss rate of 6.7% was average for the war. The total number of 16,000 Germans and 70,000 Italians serving exceeded the Soviet participation. But the expertise provided was vital. The intervention served several Soviet purposes. It provided combat experience, tested new tactics and equipment, promoted future military production, and supported an ideological ally. It brought prestige and leverage in Europe. For Spain it was a vital lifeline, despite the inflated costs. The USSR emerged as a great power able to project force globally. When Lago Caballero became Prime Minister, the Communists initially supported him, hoping he would prioritize unity and discipline to win the war. However, tension soon emerged between Lago's government and the Communists. The Communists wanted to focus on the war effort and building a centralized, disciplined army. But Lago was more interested in pursuing revolution and protected the anarchists who wanted decentralized power. At the same time, the Communist Party was growing rapidly into a mass party. Their membership skyrocketed from 60,000 to nearly 250,000 in just eight months. The Communists attracted supporters because they seemed disciplined, effective, and had experience with revolutions. They also appealed to some lower middle class people who wanted order and stability. The Communist advisors from the USSR complained that the Spanish Communist Party was disorganized compared to other Communist parties. They said the leadership was primitive and lacked resources and staff. The Popular Front policy also confused some local Communist leaders who were used to more revolutionary rhetoric. All the leftist worker parties agreed on pursuing war and revolution together. But they differed on priorities. The Communists wanted to focus on the war first and delay social revolution until after they defeated the Nationalists. But Lago and the Anarchists wanted to push ahead simultaneously with radical collectivization and decentralization of industries. The Communists advocated for more government control and nationalization of key industries, while avoiding full collectivization of the economy. They thought this state capitalism would build unity and help win the war. But Lago resisted giving the communists more economic influence. Over time, the communists grew increasingly frustrated with Lago. They accused him of being a weak leader who couldn't build an effective war effort. They saw Lago as wasting time and resources on revolutionary experiments while the nationalists were advancing. The tensions between the communists and Lago's government kept building under the surface. Soon they would boil over in a major conflict over power and strategy in the Republic. Both sides felt they had the right vision to lead Spain, but their visions proved incompatible. This internal divide would ultimately contribute to the Republic's defeat. Negrin was born in 1892 and had a privileged upbringing. He studied medicine in Germany, married a Russian musician, and built a successful career as a scientist and professor in Madrid. Though not an ideologue, he joined the Socialist Party in 1930, attracted by its moderate wing. When the civil war erupted in 1936, Negrin was brought into government as finance minister thanks to his expertise and connections. He quickly bonded with the Soviet representatives and helped transfer the Republic's gold reserves to the USSR to pay for weapons. By 1937, Negrin had gained a reputation as someone the communists could rely on. As Prime Minister Lago Caballero struggled to lead the war effort and lost support, the moderate socialists pushed for Negrin to replace him. The communists, eager for a more disciplined leadership, agreed. And so in May 1937, Negrin became head of government, promising to win the war through unity and determination. The Soviets were delighted with Negrin, seeing him as the ideal public face, a respectable scientist and social democrat who would impress foreign powers. At home, he brought the unruly factions into line, forming a streamlined cabinet that excluded the anarchists and left factions who had undermined the Republic's war efforts. Initially, Negrin's firm leadership was welcomed by a population weary of infighting. With his technocratic approach and focus on victory, he expanded the army and brought a semblance of order. But as the war dragged on catastrophically into 1938 and Negrin refused to surrender, he lost support. Only the communists remained loyal. To his critics, Negrin became a monster, the puppet of Stalin, 
callously sending men to die in a lost cause to serve Soviet interests. But others argue he was an extraordinary leader who almost saved the Republic against impossible odds, fighting on courageously when the rest of the world abandoned Spain. Whatever the verdict on Negrin, by 1939 he was a hated figure for many Republicans. But a man impossible to ignore and destined to be one of the most analyzed figures of 20th century Spain. The year 1938 marked the beginning of the end for the Spanish Republic. By September, the Soviet Union had given up on the possibility of a Republican victory and instead pushed for a negotiated settlement to end the foreign intervention in Spain. But after the Munich Agreement, it became clear even that goal was impossible. The number of Soviet military personnel in Spain dropped steadily, from around 1,000 to just 218 by early 1939. But Stalin did not completely abandon the Republic, wanting to maintain some presence and influence as long as possible. The Spanish Communist Party remained committed to continuing the resistance, under pressure from the Soviets. But the other leftist parties were growing disillusioned. The anarchist CNT still officially backed the war effort, but its members were divided, with some calling the Negrin government a virtual Soviet dictatorship. The socialists too were turning against the communists, seeing them as oppressors who would shoot them whether the republic won or lost. In November, Prime Minister Negrin made a last desperate appeal to Stalin for more weapons, painting the situation in Spain in the best possible light, and pledging close military cooperation with the USSR if the republic emerged victorious. Stalin agreed to send war arms, extending $100 million in new credit. But for the most part, these weapons arrived too late to save Catalonia. The Republic's defences were crumbling fast. Desertions were rising even in the communist-led forces. Despite Megrin's optimistic claims, the enemy now outnumbered the Republic's army and had far more planes and artillery at their disposal. The Republic was living on borrowed time and its internal divisions and disillusionment made it impossible to mount an effective resistance. Though Stalin kept up a pretense of support, the Soviet lifeline was thinning, and the Spanish left was splintering apart even as Franco's forces closed into the kill. The great Republican hope of 1938 had given way to despair as the war entered its final act. The myth of the Spanish Republic has endured over time unlike other political myths from the first half of the 20th century. The classic narrative of democracy versus fascism persists today, despite the fact that had democracy still existed in Spain in 1936, a civil war likely could not have occurred. The root cause of the war was the accelerating revolutionary process that began in the late 1800s. By 1933 to 1934, significant revolutionary strength was developing, setting the stage for conflict when military forces struck in July 1936. What would have happened without this preemptive strike? The country was experiencing constitutional collapse and economic troubles. The left was divided without coherent plans. Thus, further breakdown and chaos leading to unpredictable outcomes was likely. The most desirable change would have been a Republican realignment rebalancing political forces through constitutional means. President Azana attempted this shortly after fighting broke out by forming an all-Republican coalition, but it was too late. The only two groups with concrete revolutionary plans were the Marxist POUM and Communist PCE parties. The POUM aimed to quickly replace the left Republican government with a revolutionary regime. The PCE followed common turn directives to eventually establish a democratic republic monopolized by the left enabling elimination of rightist forces and major social to economic reforms. Contrary to myths, the PCE was not moderate or counter-revolutionary. Its calls for moderation were tactical, avoiding uncontrolled leftist violence that could provoke civil war prematurely. The PCE concretely planned to dissolve rightist groups and organs. The PCE sought to avoid war, realizing the right would gain military advantages, while foreign intervention was unpredictable. In the long term, Soviet goals likely aimed for a Soviet-style Spain. In the short term, however, Soviet intervention sought primarily to block victory of the right, not outright victory of the left. The level of intervention proved inadequate for decisive leftist victory, but sufficient to ensure prolonged civil war. The myths surrounding Spain live on, but the realities are complex. Revolutions and wars seldom follow idealistic scripts. Despite enduring solidarity with the Spanish Republic, 
The conflicts of 1936 arose from tensions and disorders in Spanish life that defied easy solutions.